So I want to thank the organizers. Um, it is a real honor to be up here talking to you all, and this is a truly intimidating <laughs> group of people. So uh, what I'm going to do today is walk you through a bit of my own trajectory and kind of highlight, hopefully, the ways in which Steve has influenced me through that tra trajectory. Um, yeah, OK. So I actually came to Steve's lab out of fresh out of an undergraduate experience at Berkeley. And somehow I never ran into Monty Slacken while I was there. But um, I was also pleased to see an MVC shirt. I think uh, Monique's PhD advisor was sporting in her talk. Um, and that was the same model of the shirts that were in vogue when I was there. And so, um, and you know, obviously there's a lot of people in this room who also came through Berkeley, including Steve. And so um, I had a fantastic experience in the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology there, studying herps um, under Harry Green. And I had such a great experience working with Harry that I really was looking for a mentor with a similar style. And, um, and so in case you can't tell, Steve is on the left in this picture, uh, and Harry is on the right. And so I came to Steve's lab and around 1998. And there I was working in the, um, I think now iconic Eagle Lake garter snake system, um, driving around to a bunch of field sites, c catching snakes, clipping tail tips for DNA and trying to understand the role of, of a patchy distribution of populations on a landscape um, for a number of different species, including uh, Thamnophis elegans and Sertalis, and one of their prey species, um, the western toad, which was Bufo boreus, which is now Anna. I want to say anaphylaxis, and that's not right. <laughs> but it is disconcerting that one of my beloved study organisms is now has its name changed. Um, and I was assisted in the field by many, many snake campers, ranging from the more inexperienced to the more experienced. And um, I will say, though, that perhaps my favorite a uh, snake camp helper was my daughter Morgan, who joined me in the field one time and is in this picture uh, very helpfully pointing out that there is actually a snake in the bag that I'm measuring. And um, for those of you who've ever met Morgan when she was very tiny, running around Cordley Hall with a, 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 a label that I stuck onto her saying, my mom is in 5045, or whatever my office number was, in case she ends up in your office and you want to return her. Um, this is her now, graduated from high school and on her way to university, Yonsei University in Korea, to study civil leadership and justice. So um, what is also present in this photograph, but not visible, is my son Rowan, who was in utero at the time. And this is Rowan today, 15 years old and 5'10". So, so many things, uh, many wonderful things were born out of my time at Oregon State working with Steve's lab, another one of which was my thesis. Um, and this is just one of a number of um, uh, results. But oh, yeah, and, 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 uh, and that. I, I don't know how to say that. I'm so sorry, Gwen. <laughs> <laughs> I messed it up. Um, I can say it this morning. Uh, just showing how there's uh, similar population structures, a uh, source sink dynamic for both of the garter snakes, where the size of the populations here are um, indicated by the size of the circles, and the direction of migration and the intensity of migration are indicated by the arrows, whereas in the formerly Bufus Bore, Bufo Boreas, um, there's larger population size and higher site fidelity. And um, I also looked at um, quantified, basically, gene flow and dispersal in Thamnophis elegans between sort of the uh, lake ecotypes and the meadow ecotypes that vary in a number of different phenotypes, including scalation and color pattern, as well as um, life history and um, and physiology and aging, which Anne Bronikowski has been working on for, for quite some time. Um, OK, so after, after my time here, I was studying population genetics 
in Steve's lab, and many of you know that around that time, there were a number of papers coming out involving things like reproductive senescence in pheromone signaling in courtship and models of sexual selection and mating system in multiple paternity and sperm competition and topping off in sperm storage and addressing these really fundamental questions in sexual selection. I was, on the other hand, was studying sperm, not sperm yet, uh, population genetics dispersal gene flow. All right, so after this, I moved to Hopkins Marine Station of Stanford University to work with Steve Palumbi to study sperm. And in some ways, sperm competition, but really looking at phenotypic variation in sperm morphological traits, namely head shape and, and head length, within and among populations of the green sea urchin. Here you, you will note that my phenotypic preferences for advisors did shift a bit, but, but his name at least is Steve, so mm -hmm. there is that. Um, and so the green sea urchin, very imaginatively named, um, even their sperm are green, I'm just kidding, that's not actually true. Um, yeah, so, so that's what I did. Meanwhile, in the Palumbi lab, the papers that were coming out around this time were all about dispersal distances in genetic lines and seascape genetics and population structure and uh, you know, a bunch of basically gene flow, population genetics, population structure, uh, phylogeography, snipping tail tips. Okay, so I think the take home message um, is that I'm not smart or strategic about my life choices in who I choose to work with at what times, but I will say that those collective experiences uh, still do <laughs> influence my choices <laughs> to this day. Um, there's a couple more, all right. Uh, just to kind of really drive home the fact that not exactly the right fit for the lab, but that's okay. Um, so I got tired of studying organisms that um, were you know, not quite resembling snakes and so I needed some more tubular structures in my life. So I moved to Syracuse University to work on this guy, not the guy, but the, there we go, that guy. It's actually a gal. This is a female uh, sperm storage organ of Drosophila melanogaster. And just so you can see that it is truly snake-like, that'll help you out a little bit. And what's going on in this sperm storage organ is obviously a lot of sperm swimming, and, and the one fun snake-related um, anecdote I can provide here is that Scott Pitnick, again, a divergent phenotype from my previous mentors, but um, his name starts with S. I'm really kind of reaching here, but, you know, there's, there's yeah, anyway, um, liked to say and tell people that, um, that sperm swimming in the sperm storage organ is a lot like, we can envision it like snakes in a tunnel. <laughs> And I'm just like, no, <laughs> that's not, they're nothing, no, <laughs> you can't say that. Um, but he did, he didn't listen to me, but, so anyway, sperm swimming in the sperm storage organ actually look a lot like this. Um, and so what you're seeing are uh, green fluorescent protein expressed in sperm heads. It's tagged a protamine um, DNA folding protein. And so what this allows us to do is um, quantify sperm movement within the sperm storage organs and quantify number of sperm and where they're located. Um, so why do we want to do this? Well, it turns out that fruit fly sperm are really dang big. And a large part of my research for the last 10 years or so has been to try to understand the how and the why of these giant sperm in Drosophila. So um, what you're seeing are some of the largest sperm that we know of, which is from Drosophila bifurca. It is, um, they're 5.8 centimeters long, 20 times longer than the male itself that produces them. And this uh, giant thing is the egg that the female produces. 
And there are six photoshopped sperm here, and they look like you know little balls of yarn. Uh, males transfer a couple dozen to the female at a time. And um, there are six of them photoshopped here to demonstrate that um, there are approximately six times as many sperm produced on a population level as there are eggs. So this is this comes about as close to isogamy as we get without actually being isogamous. All right, so we're trying to understand why giant sperm have evolved, and we think it's because of sperm competition. And so what we were doing is we were using these green fluorescent protein labeled males. We also had red fluorescent protein labeled males, and we were using these to try to understand mechanisms of sperm competition as a way of getting at um, the functional significance of giant sperm in Drosophila. And so when folks study sperm competition, they're often looking at paternity success, and we characterize it as P2, or the proportion of progeny sired by the second male. Um, and, but just looking at, at a proportion alone doesn't necessarily tell you if there's what kind of, the, what's, what's the nature of selection going on. Just because uh, a value of a high P2 could indicate that there are um, second male sperm coming in that are directly interfering or competing with or incapacitating or disabling the first male's sperm, which would lead to strong selection, you could also get the same P2 that results from just there being fewer sperm left over in the sperm storage organs. Um, and when the second male comes in, second male sperm come in, um, the female is just using those in direct proportion to their abundance in storage, and that could lead to just weak, weak selection on sperm traits. So in order to get at sperm competition, uh, in, in a more nuanced way, we use these uh, basically green and red labeled sperm. And, um, and keep in mind that these are the sperm heads. The actual tails are taking up the rest of the, the sperm storage organ because they're so long. So in Melanogaster, are relatively, they're relatively short of about uh, 1.8 or so millimeters long. So not, not necessarily measured in centimeters. All right, so what we could do with this system is mate females to, say, a green male first and then a red male second, which is what this is showing you, um, and then dissect females at different time points after mating to quantify exactly how many of the first male sperm versus the second male sperm are in different parts of the female reproductive tract and really try to get at snapshots in time and, and paint a picture of what are the events um, during sperm competition. And so um, we did this and, and identified four major events that are involved in sperm competition. The first being sperm transfer, um, where males are transferring um, their ejaculate more or less towards the end of copulation, and it lands just sort of, this is the female reproductive tract, and it lands in here. This is obviously a GFP male. Um, this is the sperm storage organ showing the um, resident RFP labeled sperm in storage over here that are, I don't know if you can see them, but, oh yeah, you can. Um, these are a, a different type of sperm storage organ called the spermatheci, there's a pair of them. Uh, sperm are also stored in there. So sperm are first transferred, they land in this area called the bursa, and um, then displacement begins almost immediately. Uh, these, this, Time points are indicated by 10 minutes ASM or after the start of mating or 15 minutes. So here's 15 minutes. Sperm are immediately starting to enter storage and are physically displacing the resident sperm from this main sperm storage organ called the seminal receptacle or the SR. And they're also entering the spermatheci. Now, interestingly enough, the displacement happens primarily in the SR. Um, but in the spermatheci, you really have only this topping off mechanism where they're just kind of filling up. There isn't really displacement happening. And so when, the, when I observed this, I was like, oh, it's topping off. I can use that. So I, it's not in the title, but it's somewhere else in the paper. Um, 
And then, so this displacement pr uh, process ends, basically, um, when the female ejects this excess sperm. So, so males transfer about 1,500 sperm or so, and females can really only fit 500. So they're transferring about three, maybe four times as many sperm as can actually fit in their sperm storage organs. So some that extra sperm's gotta go somewhere. And so she ejects it. Um, and then when that happens, there's no more sperm left in the bursa to enter storage and that ends the displacement process. And then at some time later, later females um, are laying eggs based on what's present in the, in what we call this fertilization set, what, whatever is left over in the sperm storage organs once the dust settles. Okay, so what we have found is that more sperm are better. Um, males that transfer more sperm uh, also displace a greater proportion of resident sperm. We also found that longer sperm displace more sperm, and um, this uh, jives with previous research um, from Scott Pitnick, where um, showing that that longer sperm outcompete shorter sperm. Um, we also found that the timing of female ejection. So if females wait longer to eject the excess sperm, she allows more displacement to occur. And, and then you, you get a higher P2, basically. And so the timing of ejection is a mechanism of cryptic female choice in this system that's, that's fairly easily quantifiable. All right, there, there's stuff that happens around egg lane, but I don't really have time to get into that. All right, so we find that long sperm outcompete short sperm. This is not news. We knew this already um, based on experimental evolution study that, that experimentally evolved um, long sperm populations with extra long sperm or extra short sperm um, and, and mated them, whoop, that's the wrong way, and mated them to females um, in, in both orders, so long first, then short, or short first and long, and looked at P2, and the long males tended to do better, okay? Um, but it takes two to tango, as we saw earlier. Um, and so what also matters is the length of the seminal receptacle. So we can also experimentally evolve females to have longer SRs or shorter SRs, and when we set up a sperm competitive scenario with long sperm versus short sperm in, within a long SR or a short SR, we find that it's really only the long SRs that are exhibiting this phenomenon, and so we are saying that long SRs are choosier. They're more selective for sperm length. And so we're using um, female, or rather the SR length as another female preference mechanism of cryptic female choice. And this is a female preference that is easily quantifiable. It basically varies along a single axis. It's highly heritable. And, um, and so we can have both quantified measures of female preference and male trait. So this is just an image of the female reproductive tract of Drosophila bifurca. These SRs are eight centimeters long, super coiled within the female's abdomen. And as you might guess, the um, length of the SR and the length of sperm are correlated across species. And also within species, these are um, populations undergoing incipient speciation of Drosophila mojavensis. And so we have correlated evolution of this male trait, female pre preference. A logical question to ask would be, could this be driven by a Fisher-Landy process? And um, one evidence that points to probably, maybe, yes, is that there is um, indeed a positive, let me just talk you through. All right, so this is um, heritabilities along the diagonal phenotypic correlations below the diagonal and genetic correlations above the diagonal. And we do see a positive genetic correlation between SR length and sperm length. 
as well as incidentally a positive or rather a, a negative correlation between remating day and SR length. And what this means is that longer, females with longer SRs remate sooner. So in post-copulatory sexual selection, we use remating rate as a proxy for the strength of sexual selection. So females that remate with multiple males on a shorter time scale are providing more opportunities for sperm competition in post-copulatory sexual selection. And females with longer SRs are kind of promoting more intense sexual selection. So we get a genetic correlation between essentially promiscuity and SR length and, and the female preference. Um, so, all right, so if sperm and SRs are co-evolving along a fissure um, landing process, could we then be considering sperm length to be an ornament? And if it were an ornament, we would expect potentially some positive allometry with body size. And if we compare allometries um, with other um, ornaments in nature, we get some positive allometries, especially you know up here with the pheasants. Um, if we throw Drosophila onto that, they have an allometry that is that kind of blows everybody out of the water a little bit. And so we're using this to argue that um, sperm length can be considered to be an ornament, and it may very well be evolving under a fissure landing process. This is something I would love to be able to test more explicitly. And frankly, in, in listening to a lot of the talks um, today, Drosophila are like the best. <laughs> and everybody should study them, because um, we've got, you know, Thousands of species. We have a pretty decent time tree. We've got amazing phenotypic variation. We can look at microevolution and macroevolution. There's immense genetic and uh, population resources. Um, and if anybody, I have a male trait, female preference system ready to go. If anybody wants to start looking at, I don't know. Gene matrices are probably cigar shaped, wildly cigar shaped in this system. Like, yeah, come play with me. So, that being said, uh, so I started all of this journey at Eagle Lake, which um, I'm a little bit surprised nobody has been showing pictures of Eagle Lake. I don't know. Uh, there's, there were a few. There were a few. Um, and I guess. Uh, I feel like my my trajectory has come a little bit full circle, full circle, just because I'm I'm kind of late to the game, um, studying something completely different when I first started in Steve's lab. But I'm getting on board. I'm getting on board to to phenotypic evolution and and trait space, um, and. And so the influence of being in the environment around Steve in the early formative years has kind of stayed with me. Um, and, and I will also say that that snake camp, I know a lot of us in this room spent at least some time at snake camp. Snake camp still looms large in my memory. And I, I think I thanked like 50, young and old research assistants in my dissertation because so many people came out over different years, including, um, I think, uh, there's, there's Lucy and Juliet Ross. Yeah. Um, there's a familiar face. And, you know, and so I think, I think Snake Camp was really meaningful to a lot of us, and I just want to acknowledge that. And I, um, and then also, you know, obviously Steve was the center center of it, that this was not at snake camp, this was in Mexico. Um, but I, I do, like I was thinking, there are all these Steve-isms I think that we have accumulated over the years, right? And maybe some of you can also like think of your own. Um, one that, that, that I carry with me to this day is he, one time he said to me, 
don't work hard, work smart. And I was like, like, whoa, I've not been working smart this whole time. Um, other things that he, he has said repeatedly that I've sort of forgotten, but today they're, they're all coming back to me. One being, um, I'm secure enough in my masculinity, <laughs> which I've started saying that whenever I wear bright pink, I'll tell people I'm secure enough in my masculinity to wear pink. Um, another thing that he likes to, I don't know if he still does this, whenever he picks up something heavy, he says, la hua la hia. And now I do that, and nobody knows what I'm talking about. Do you still do that? <laughs> um, the other thing that, that he used to say that I now say is um, he would describe food if it was good. He would say, this is completely edible. <laughs> so now I do that. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which Steve has influenced me in my career. Um, and I know that in, in throughout sort of the trajectory of chasing all of these different study systems, um, and, and I know that the title of my talk was a tale of two systems because really I don't consider, like, it, really my two systems are like snakes and sperm because, you know, who needs legs? So, all right, that's it. Thank you. Does sperm life affect offspring Yes. So this is... Uh, Where did that voice come from? <laughs> I'm like, who's back there? <laughs> does, does, does sperm affect offspring fitness? Sperm length. Sperm length, yes. Um, yes. And both fitness of sons and daughters. So, um, so we did a study looking at fitness consequences in inbred lines that were derived from those selected populations, and locked at both um, sort of intralocus conflict and or evidence for. But it, it turns out that so long sperm genotypes produce increased longevity in both males and females. And there's some other stuff too, but that's the most succinct. <laughs>